so Sally just asked me to give an overview of what uh, silver pasture systems in the UK look like. Um, so I'll just take you on a little bit of a tour of various systems um, and some of the kind of management maintenance issues that they've been thinking about. So we always like to start with a definition. Silver pasture is an agroforestry system. So at this level, it's just the integration of trees and livestock. Um, but really, we try and emphasise that there are both ecological and economic interactions between the trees and the other components of the system. And really, the idea is to make the most of the positive interactions and to try and minimise the negative interactions like competition for resources. But actually, several pastoral systems have long been a part of our UK landscape, and we can think of lots of tra traditional uh, silver pasture systems across the UK, um, for example, hedgerows, remind me how many kilometres, 700,000 kilometres, yeah, in Great Britain, <laughs> <laughs> um, and obviously they, they were planted originally to be a stockproof barrier to keep livestock in the fields, as well as providing other products for the local community, uh, such as wood fuel or foraging opportunities. And then the orchards traditionally would have been grazed um, to manage the understory. And then you've got these kind of iconic landscapes, um, ranging from like the wood pasture um, systems like the New Forest National Park, through to beautiful parkland landscapes, a bit like what we drove through on the way, on the way here this morning. We can also think about agroforestry and silver pastoral systems where trees have been planted for environmental protection. For example, riparian buffers, so planting long watercourses to protect them from any runoff from surrounding farmland. Um, and then particularly valuable in exposed sites, uh, shelter belts, uh, where strategically planted uh, belts of trees will provide protection for um, crops and livestock. And then more recently, we've gone into these more integrated systems where trees are planted within the fields uh, to provide benefits to the uh, livestock or to provide additional products. Um, and we'll have a look at these in a bit more detail. This system is uh, not far from the Organic Research Centre, just down the road outside Hungerford. And it's the lovely Bill Ackworth who planted trees uh, probably about 25, 30 years ago. Yeah. Um, and it actually started off with um, as an arable, silver arable system, so he was very much cropping in, in the alleyways there. He had maybe three or four main crop timber species planted in there, um, with lots of random range of different species in between. And his, his business plan, I guess, was that these other species of trees would be, um, would be uh, marketed as amenity trees, so for people doing landscape plantings, um, he's got this impressive um, tree stage which would dig out, you know, kind of semi-mature, well not mature, but large trees and tra transplant them elsewhere. Um, that didn't really happen, to be honest. I don't think Bill's the best at marketing and um, getting out and doing it. So he's ended up with quite a dense um, system there. And he's now looking <coughs> to, obviously it's now just grazed and lightly grazed. The productivity in the, in the pasture is not amazing. Um, but now he's looking to manage it and open up the canopy a bit more by pollarding um, and actually you can see here he's just lopped some of the branches off for the sheep to, to feed on directly. <coughs> this is Elm Farm where we're based, we're in the offices in the middle there. Um, 85 hectare livestock farm just outside Newbury and we've got some hedges, um, we've got some beautiful old infield trees there but over the last few years and we've helped from the Woodland Trust as well, we've looked to increase tree planting on the, on the farm. Um, so we've got various projects going on there. One is looking at actually making better use of the, the existing hedgerow network for, uh, for wood fuel. The second is an alley crop in silver pastoral system. And the third is new, new tree planting, like I say, um, supported by the Woodland Trust. And there's some photos here. So up in the top left, we've got um, the composite of the hedgerow system, um, with the end product being wood chip um, for bioenergy production. And these are the three new plantings. So this is a, supposed to be a grand tree avenue running alongside a bridleway, but it's a productive tree avenue. So there's, there's timber species in there, there's um, hairy pears, and also some cider apple trees as well. Um, so we've teamed up with a local cider producer who will eventually come and, and crop those. He's responsible for managing those. And then we've got infield trees. Um, so we've planted to basically be the next generation of, of um, the infield trees as the oaks decline in time. We've had to give them um, good protect protection because we've got cattle on the, on the farm. 
Um, and then the, the third new tree planting is well, hedgerow planting. And it's a bit unusual because it's not a uh, traditional hedgerow species, it's not thorny species, it's very much designed as a quick growing hedge for bioenergy production going forward. So we've got willow in there, we've got um, sycamore and hazel. Uh, we've had sweet chestnut, but it really didn't take. So it's those three species. Um, and the idea would be that that would coppice, be coppice maybe on a seven, eight year rotation um, for wood fuel, wood chip production. As for the um, summer pastoral system, we've got um, an alley cropping system. When I say alley cropping, it's with pasture in the alleys, uh, where we've combined short rotation coppice. Uh, this is planting short rotation coppice. We've got alder as well as willow. Um, and we looked at different methods of getting them established in terms of weed control. This was like a, a jute fabric mix, um, which actually very quickly broke down, so it didn't do a particularly good job. And we found actually just applying wood chip was as good as anything um, for getting things established. And this came free from our local tree surgeon, so it was um, a win-win for everyone, really. In the first kind of five, five years or so, we just... Um, we just cut it for silage, uh, so we didn't need to worry about protecting the trees. I have to say the willow was really munched on by the deer, um, so that was a real problem. But interestingly, the alder wasn't tasty, um, so you know, if you, if you don't want to go down the route of, of putting in deer protection, uh, deer fencing, maybe choose species that are less palatable, um, and alder definitely seemed to be one of those. And then eventually we got the cattle in just for a short period. Um, we just use electric fencing to keep them out of the trees. Um, just a single line seemed to be enough. One of the big problems with that was um, actually water. <coughs> we only had a single trough in the field, so kind of managing that access was meant it was a bit a bit trickier. Whereas ideally we'd have managed it kind of alley by alley and had um, moving water water trough. So a couple of years ago. Um, Basically, the, the alleys needed reseeding, um, but we put it into a crop of, of, um, of barley, um, so we ploughed it up and reseeded. And now it's actually gone back into a diverse lay um, and will be grazed by the sh We've got sheep on the farm now. This is the Nepa State. I'm sure many people have heard about it. Um, it's down in East Sussex, is that right? West Sussex? Sussex. <laughs> and uh, it's where Charlie Burrell has been um, going down this route to rewilding. It's a really interesting story there. Um, and <coughs> so, yeah, you can see the tree management there so it's to keep these big long horn up off um, damaging the trees. But yeah, you know, the trees play a really important role in that system. Um, and I think I went to a presentation they gave at Groundswell last week, and their end vision, their end point really is this idea of a wood pasture, so something very much like the new forest. Um, grazing animals and, and rooting animals as part of that, that system. This is a, a fodder hedge that they had planted very much with the um, uh, tree fodder in mind for the livestock. This is going over to South Snowdonia now, over to Wales, um, and it was a, a chap called Peter Bottom, who's a real entrepreneur, he'd um, taken over some of the forestry over there and was doing lots of added value in terms of um, processing the wood on site. Um, but he saw an opportunity for integrating livestock into that system to help with the weed management. So he had mixed new plantings of um, uh, conifers and broadleaf trees, and he was putting geese and pigs in there as well to help with the weed control. Um, just as in the summer period, just during the growing, growing period, um, and that's, yeah, it'd be interesting to go back, that was a few years ago, and see whether he made that a success. This is up in Scotland now. Um, this is a, a farmer up in Fife who had planted quite a lot of um, wood, uh, farm woodland. And he was a bit frustrated because there was all this lush grass growing underneath, but he wasn't really supposed to be grazing in the, in the woodland. Um, but he just went for it anyway. Um, and I think now the rules up there have slightly changed that uh, woodland grazing is actually an accepted part of, of the management and correct me if I'm wrong here Sally, but you can get paid to put your animals into the woodland you get paid to take them out as well which yeah. seems so amazing <laughs> <laughs> if, if you had a proper grazing management plan um, but yeah it was funny there because he 
he was saying basically he puts a cattle in and they, they roam around and he's like, no, 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 they don't damage the trees, they really don't damage the trees. And right behind him, this cow was just basically grabbing this quite a thin tree and pulling it down and he heard this crack and it was like, yes. <laughs> um, back to Shropshire now, and this is Peter Aspin's site um, uh, called uh, Over in Shropshire. 20 acres um, with quite wide alleys, 20 metre alleys and north-south orientation, so kind of classic alley, alley cropping setup. And he has got cow cows and the cattle in there, manages simply through electric fencing. And interestingly, the trees are, he's got all sorts of species in there, quite some quite random ones as well, but trees for browsing, so ash, elm, honey locust and black locust, and then he's got a range of nut, nut trees as well. Tim Downs is a farmer just down the road from Peter and he really took in inspiration from Peter and, and decided to develop his own silver pastoral system. Um, and these were planted, Helen, how many years ago? 2014. 2014. And I, I really must update these photos because <laughs> the trees must have grown since <laughs> yeah, then. Um, but it's, he's got an uh, organic dairy system um, and he saw two main roles for the trees in his system. So. He's got species um, planted for, for kind of their nutritional value, um, four different species there. And then just around the actual dairy, he's got um, willow, which he looks at more from, for their medicinal value. Um, so willow have um, salicylic acid, contains salicylic acid, which is a pain relief. Is there, is there an additional point to the there as well? He's got walnuts around the dairy. Ah, okay. And the walnuts give up a fair amount. That's right. They keep the, fly the flies off. Yeah. Which is which a, we'll talk about yeah, This is um, Alton Project. Um, and uh, again, this has been in partnership with the Woodland Trust, where they're looking at different densities of trees and the impact on grass production underneath. Um, and maintain their um, direct payments is very much sheep have been grazing continuously throughout that um, and there's been lots of monitoring in terms of looking at pasture growth um, sheep productivity um, tree growth and everything and I think the, there's been some issues there in terms of protection of the trees isn't there with sheep having a bit of a, a browse on them but um, it'll be interesting to see how that develops so I guess the most mature systems of these kind of integrated systems um, around are the Silvo Pastoral um, National Network, National, Net National Experimental Network, um, and alongside that was a Silver Arable um, Network as well. And my understanding, Steve, is a site here is not formally part of this, but was very much at the same time, um, yeah. so at a similar stage. And these were set up in the, in the late 1980s on six sites. Um, and it's very much a research project, so there, there are replications of these different approaches, a comparison with just a pasture only and with a tree only um, control. And ongoing, well, in the early stages, measuring productivity interactions between the trees and the, the understory, economics and environmental impacts as well. And in terms of the silver pastoral, sites um, that range from kind of Scotland right down to Northwick in, in Devon um, and then more on the west in Henface is the one off in Bangor. Um, there's two photos there from Henface. And then over to Loch Gaul in Northern Ireland. This is the one up in Glensock in Scotland. And they all had common treatments. Um, so you all used, um, I think it was sycamore was a, the common species throughout. And then at each site they also had their own kind of species that they required. Um, and for example, in Henface, they looked at different planting arrangements. So having the kind of regularly spaced trees at the top and then same densities of trees in, in terms of per hectare, but looking at a clumped approach as well, which kind of looks nicer as a landscape feature. Um, what they found, I think, from having kind of clumps of 11 trees, um, you get the ones around the outside wouldn't have such great form for timber, but the ones in the centre would be kind of better in terms of timber, timber quality. So these are some of the key results from these trials. Um, basically, in the in the first kind of years post planting, first nine years, there was no reduction in, in the sheep, no reduction in the sheep production, and that's with trees at 400 trees per hectare. Lots of benefits in terms of increased species diversity of insects, ground insects, and birds. 
problem there is that the sheep were, the sheep were using the trees for shelter, um, but this also led to compaction around, around the trees. Um, benefits to kind of water management, higher water infiltration in the silver pasture plots, um, and at uh, Hen Face in, in Wales, they actually use red alder. Red alder is one of their species. And they found that the production, grass production in these plots was as high as in the pasture control plots, which had additional nitrogen added. Um, so potential role there in terms of nitrogen fixing by the, the older trees. A couple of weeks ago, I was over in Northern Ireland um, and dropped in to see a colleague, uh, Professor Jim McAdam, who was based at AFB and Queen's University in Belfast. He's, he's just retired, um, but he seems as busy as, as ever. And he, he was very much responsible for one of the, the experimental trial sites. Um, so this is at Loch Ball in County Omar. And I'd say it's probably the best example out of the, the existing network sites because the management has kind of continued, whereas a lot of these other sites, they had management in the early years, but like with all research funding, funding disappeared and it was a bit kind of forgotten. Whereas here, they've, you know, they've, they've carried on doing research, they've carried on doing management. Um, and so just want to share some of the results. I have to say thanks to Jim for, for sending these slides through. So there they had um, three, um, three uh, experiments. On <coughs> We had the pasture with the perennial ryegrass, um, the silver pastoral system with ash trees planted at 400 trees per hectare, and then the woodland planted with ash trees at 2,500 stems per hectare. So there were the, the three um, trials. And these are just some photos, as you, you can see it developing over time. So sheep were put in there from the very start. And they're getting bigger um, over time. This is some data on looking at tree growth, and you can see, so they're planted in 1989, 1990. You can see as the tree develops, um, so the, the green line is, is the height, and the bars are the diameter. It's not going around, isn't it? Um, so it's kind of starting to tail off at, um, between 2009, 2014, so between 20 and 25 years, they're kind of reaching maturity. In terms of economics, um, throughout the basic payment was unaffected, so still able, able to claim um, the whole site. And there they found full sheep productivity uh, for the first 12 years. Um, and they harvested at year 13. Um, and it's quite niche, I guess, but um, we're looking at hurley quality or hurley production from these ash butts. I know, Steve, you're, that's something you're interested in as well, isn't it? The hurley sticks, obviously a big thing in Northern Ireland. And it brought in this income of um, over a thousand euros per hectare. <coughs> They've done lots of research out there looking at biodiversity benefits. So here you've got the grassland on the left, the agroforestry in the middle, and the woodland to the right. And in terms of spiders, birds, and beetles, there's significant, um, significantly more found in the agroforestry, which is a nice story. And um, Rodrigo, I think a few years ago, went out and dug up <laughs> a couple of the ash trees and the ash trees to, to measure the carbon uh, in the ash. Um, and this, you know, this is the total on the right. And you kind of tend to think that most of the carbon is locked up in the, in the trunk, but actually the lime branches contribute a significant amount there as well. And so looking at these, um, these trees, you're looking at 77 tonnes per hectare of, of carbon in, in the above ground component. Looking below ground, they found that the ash, silver pastoral, um, and the woodland systems have more carbon stored in the soil than the grassland, which I guess is unsurprising. But when you add in the carbon stored in the wood as well, these systems are, uh, can be considered quite sustainable moving forward um, with this aim of kind of carbon neutral livestock farming, which is something they're very interested in in, in Northern Ireland. Um, and the final piece of research from there that I've got my hands on anyway, is um, they've been looking at this idea of the, the silver pastoral site extending the grazing season. Um, so this graph, you're running from the beginning of um, August through to the end of May. Dark blue is the grassland and the pale blue is the agroforestry and it's moisture con content up the left hand side there. And it, it's looking at, well assuming that 40% of the soil moisture is, is the cutoff, so that's when you take livestock out, out from, the, from the field. Um, and so you can see 
Uh, this is when the grassland reaches 40% going into the autumn, and this is when it drops um, at the end of May, um, going below 40% again. Whereas in the agroforestry, it's only going above 40% out of mid-December uh, and dropping earlier, so end of March there. So actually this leads to 17 weeks longer that the animals can be outside under the trees compared to the, the um, neighbouring pasture plot. Um, so you get five extra in, in spring and five extra in autumn. So I'll just make one point on that slide, it's very useful for some <coughs> that 60% of permanent grassland productivity occurs in the period of the year when ash has got no leaves, and that graph shows it perfectly. <coughs> so that's why there's less competition between the grass and the deciduous trees. Those are trees that are about 30 years old as well. Well, I'm not sure. Yeah, so 16, so just a couple of years ago. Yeah. What's the impact in a dry summer? Because obviously that's the dry effect yeah, in the winter. Well, I guess the, the canopy will reduce water loss anyway, so actually it's a lot greener underneath um, than it would be necessarily in the pasture. I mean, if you think to last year, you know, a lot of the, the green grass was kind of <coughs> next to hedges or under trees. Um, <coughs> So this is Jim, um, and looking forward, I mean, he's, there's always, I suppose what we're not really at a stage in the UK, we don't have many systems that have kind of gone through to maturity, so we're not really, it's kind of got a head around what to do at the end of the productive life of the tree, whether it's for apple trees or, or timber, um, you know, do you go out and clear fell and plant again, or, or do you just selectively thin, or, you know, if you clear fell, you're kind of losing the, the benefits of the trees. And Jim's vision for this site is very much selective thinning, um, and they've started now, so they've gone from 400 down to about 200, and the next stage will be to about 100. And then, as you can see here, they've started planting the next generation within the gaps. I don't know how successful that is in terms of, you know, there's quite a lot of competition for light there, um, but his aim really is to maintain this, the benefits of silver pasture rather than going out and completely clearing the trees. So, yeah. 